Hi everyone, welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. Before I get started with today's video, I want to give a shout out and a hello to all the fantastic people I met yesterday at the Vintage Computer Festival up in Seattle, Washington. I drove up there and had a fantastic time. It was my first time attending that event and I have to tell you I will be back next time as well. I just saw so many cool computers, talked to so many fun people, saw some great talks and the museum up there is just fantastic. So anyways, back to the video. So today we're going to talk about an interesting Commodore computer. The Commodore C16. This thing is one of the later machines that came out from Commodore after the Commodore 64. There's a lot of information on the, the history of this machine online and other YouTube videos, so I won't really talk too much about that. But today, this machine is not working and I'd like to repair it. So, let's take a look at it. So the C16 I have is in fantastic condition. This was actually given to me by a member of the Commodore Club here in Portland. Now, when I got this computer, I opened it up and took a look. And let's pull the keyboard off. Now, it had the heat shield installed, which I've already taken off. But you'll notice there's two problems right away. The core of this computer, the heart, so to speak, is missing. This top socket is for the CPU. The bottom socket is for the TED chip. So the TED chip in the 264 based Commodores does everything pretty much. I mean, other than CPU stuff and ROM and RAM, it handles all the timing and all the graphics and all the sound. So without this chip, you're not gonna get very far. So one of the big issues is that both the CPU and the TED chip are very custom parts. Not only are they custom, but they fail pretty frequently. I wouldn't be surprised if someone took the chips out of this machine to save another plus four or Commodore 16 because they're just so unreliable. Now, lucky for me, I happen to have a replacement TED chip that has been tested in another machine and it actually works. Here's the TED chip close up. The model number is 8360R2 from 1984. It's a MOS part and that plugs here into this socket. So the CPU in these machines is very similar to the 6510 but it has additional I.O. pins. Essentially on this machine, the serial port for the disk drives and the cassette port are handled directly by the CPU and no longer by the 6526. But because of that, it means looking for an 8501 CPU. Well, and those aren't exactly hard to find. So taking a look at eBay here, we look for 8501 MOS and we do find a couple for sale, but $49 with shipping, and who knows if these are actually tested. Let's click on this one and take a look. That's pretty steep to pay. $7 shipping. It doesn't even say that this chip is tested. Oh, it works tested. All right, that popped up at the very end. $55. Here's another one, $77 with people watching from Germany. I think a lot of the reasons these chips are so expensive is they didn't sell a lot of these computers but also they fail very frequently. So there's a second possibility for replacing the bad CPU, and it's an FPGA based replacement. Let's take a look at the large image here. So that plugs into the CPU socket and you see there there's a Xilinx FPGA on there. Now this is gonna be very reliable. Hopefully it works 100%, I haven't really looked into it, but it's also kind of pricey, 45 pounds at least from this seller and actually doesn't look like it's in stock although one recently sold here on March 8th, so that was earlier this month, but again, kind of pricey. So one of my big issues with the Plus 4 and the C16 is that these computers are kind of novelties. The TED chip is way less capable than the VIC when it comes to sprites and graphics capabilities. This does support more colors, but ultimately, the graphics and sound are just not as good. So I really don't feel like going and spending $50, $60 to try to get the machine working, especially because like the TED chip here, like I said, is very unreliable. So how good is this computer gonna be even if I did spend that money? So there's actually a third possibility for getting this computer working. And it's right here. This is an MOS 6510. This is the CPU out of a Commodore 64. And while I said earlier that this lacks the IO pins to not work in this computer, there's actually a way that to adapt this. I was doing some searching trying to figure out how I was going to fix this computer and I came across this blog and he outlines a way to use the 6510 CPU in these machines. I'll put a link to his blog in the description below so you can check it out yourself. But he came up with a way to use an adapter here to get it working. 
Now, because I'm kind of cheap, I didn't want to buy the adapter from him because essentially, again, I don't even know if this computer works. So I was going to try to make this adapter myself. But there's another issue with this. And remember the replacement kernel wrong. Now, the kernel on these machines is what controls those I.O. pins directly to make the cassette drive and the floppy drive work. And the 6510 and the 8501 have different I.O. port mappings. So the stock kernel is absolutely not going to work quite right, at least when you're trying to use these external peripherals without a modified kernel. But I think the first thing to do is to at least just make the adapter and put the CPU into this computer just to see if it's even working at all, and then we'll worry about the kernel. So I came up with a text file here that shows all the pin mapping to help me make this adapter. And you can see the 8501 on the left here and the 6510 on the right. And it's generally similar. But take a look at the data lines and some of these other pins. They're sort of shifted by one and things aren't in exactly the right place. These P0 through P7, these are the additional I.O. pins that the 8501 has over the 6510. And you see there's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, there's no 5, and then there's a 6, 7. We, meanwhile, the 6510 has 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it's missing only one, but unfortunately the fact that 5 is an internal register inside here, then there's 6 and 7 exposed, that breaks all the kernel mapping. And then we scroll down here, and I've kind of showed how this works. So if you imagine these outside brackets here, these are the socket for the 6510, or I'm sorry, that's the socket for the 8501, that's the original processor, and the 6510 is inserted, shifted up one pin. So you see pins one and 40 are hanging off the end of the adapter here. And then I created a little rewiring chart where I will have to solder some jumper wires between these pins to get this wired up correctly. So this is the 6510 I'm gonna use for this project. And uh, you see that it has a little extra pin header attached here. The reason for this, if I pull this off, this was removed off of a C64 that didn't have a socket. Because of that, the pins are cut short because normally when this is inserted into the PCB when there's no socket, uh, they cut the bottoms of the legs off after it's soldered in. So it means they're kind of short. And because of that, I'm gonna build the adapter using these pin headers and I'm just going to bend these pins out and then I'm gonna solder them on to this. So I will be soldering wires directly onto these pins, so please don't cringe. It can be reversed if I wanted to use this back in, like, say, a C64. But ultimately, if this works, I'm going to be leaving this in that Commodore 16 for good. I printed this out to help me make the wiring, and for clarity, I have marked all the pins that we're going to be soldering onto. All right, so let's build the adapter. Essentially, I need all the pins on the motherboard, basically 1 to 20 and 21 to 40 in the motherboard because we're going to be soldering wires onto here. But any that don't have the dashes here, so see uh, pins 1, 2, 3, 4, there are no dashes there. That means that the pin on the, the processor, the 6510, cannot connect into this pin header. This is what's going to go into the motherboard. So I will need to bend those pin out. So let's plug this together. I'm going to start building this out. As a side note, you have to use these round precision sockets. It will not work if you use the kind of cheaper pin headers. Those just don't plug into the motherboard very well. And uh, I really recommend you go buy some of these. Okay, so now we have the correct number of pins bent out. So the top three pins that go in the socket are bent. The top one here just hangs off the end. That one hangs off the end. Then there's one bent there, which matches here. This matches that, that, and these three. So let's do the wiring. I have a little handy chart to help you do it. And I personally am just gonna use this little bodge wire, I have a little spool of it. I'll be soldering right on. Now a few things to notice. On this chart here, there are a couple pins that have stars. And that means they're not connected. So the 8510 had a gate in signal. There is no equivalent pin on the 6510, so that's not connected. This P3 pin, we're not going to be using that, so that will be not connected. And essentially, these two as well were on the 6510, NMI and the Phi 2, and these won't be connected because there's no equivalent pin on the 8510. So not all of these bent pins are going to have something connected to them. 
All right, so what I'm gonna do right now is I'm going to tin up these extra pins. All right, and based on the chart here, we need to tin some of these pins here that we'll be plugging into the socket. Luckily, you see there's just a thicker part right here, and this is where we're gonna solder the little bodge wires onto. So at this point, it's just a matter of following the chart. And actually, these first uh, three pins we're gonna solder are very close together, so I'm actually just gonna use some cut off resistor legs or whatever these were from, I don't know, some kind of component legs. I'm just gonna form them and that will allow me to make these connections right here. And pin four, you see down here on the chart, well you can't because it's off camera, but pin four is one of the ones we're not connecting. So this fourth pin just is gonna hang out there and do nothing. All right, so it's not super pretty, but I basically formed those little metal bits and now it's connected to those first three pins. Looking at the chart, we actually have some more of those that are very close together. So 21 goes to 22 and 22 goes to 23. So that's right here. 23 is not connected to anything. And these other two go further away. So we're gonna use wires for those. All right, that's a little annoying to, to make this, but I've done it and it's a little messy. Not so great. Pretty crappy soldering job on my part, but you know, there we go, should work. So what I'm just gonna do quickly is I'm going to tone out using my multimeter here. So we're just going to check the chart and make sure that all the pin mapping is correct. All right, so it's pin one to pin one. So pin one on the CPU to pin one. And make sure these none of these other pins are touching. Pin one to pin one. So there we go. I made the adapter. It's kind of ugly, but I'm gonna put this in that Commodore C16 and it should work. Alright, so I'm gonna put a little deoxy here. So the socket here for the TED is this really horrible single wipe socket. And in fact, this one looks to be single wipe as well. So that's certainly less than desirable. Now there's a capacitor here that's sort of in the way. So I'll just bend that over. And the way this goes in, remember, these pins go into every pin on the socket. So the, these, the pin headers and the CPU is one over. Now the, nat, the notch matches the notch, so that is heading to my left. I think we're in. Make sure this doesn't pop out. So one of the problems is if the sockets aren't happy having pin headers stuck in, they sometimes pop out on their own, but that one seems to go in all right. And then we have the TED chip. It's on this little piece of foam. This one looks like it's never been soldered. It has a check mark on it, so I know I've Tested that. All right, so we're basically ready to test at this point. So the C16 takes a single nine volt input and it's a DC barrel jack connector on the side. But warning, before you connect up a regular power supply, it is a center negative. So the outside of the DC connector here is positive and the center is negative and that is different than most things. So I'm gonna be using my bench power supply and it's a little crappy, but you notice I here I have these uh, clip leads. So they're reversed and I'm going to use my multimeter and double check. So turn on the power supply. And let's grab the multimeter here. It's on volts, center, negative. So you put the center, the negative in the center pin and you touch the outside. We're getting plus 9.192 volts, which is perfect. And I'm ready to test this now. 
All right, so the Sony PVM is connected over here. I'm using composite cable and I will plug this in. It uses a regular Commodore 16 connector. Make sure that's off and it is. I have the power supply up above set for 9.2 volts and let's turn this on. Nothing. Well, that's a disappointment. That is a disappointment. So I do have another machine. I think I'll just have to test this processor and TED chip in, make sure it's working. And let me try that again. So it's normal. The monitor is just making weird sync signal and that's correct. That's what happens on these. You first turn them on. Damn it. All right, I have my plus four on the bench here hooked up. This uses its own big brick here. This machine should be working. Let's turn this on and just check. All right, there we go. So I know the monitor's connected and everything right. I'm gonna test the processor and the TED in this machine and see if those are dead. And if they both work, then there's another fault with the C16. Ugh. All right, so here's my plus four on the bench. And I tested with the TED chip that I was using in the other machine. The TED chip that was in this plus four has these heat sinks on it. This one absolutely works fine in this machine. It comes up fine. And then I put the CPU I just made and wired up into this machine. And when I turn it on, there we go. Uh, we're getting space bar because the keyboard is laying on the space bar. But it absolutely came up, as you can see. So that means that there is another fault in that other machine. These two chips here are ROM chips. And this chip, which I've removed, is a PLA. So there is another... So there is a PLA type chip in these, and I don't know if these are prone to dying or not, but if this is dead, then I'm up a creek because these are also irreplaceable. The ROMs, no problem. I can just burn EPROMs for these. But this one, mm. so I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna test that out inside the other machine. So on my other computer, I have this sort of copper heatsink here. It's, this is the PLA, and unfortunately, it gets pretty hot. And what happens is the keyboard on the plus four is so close to the board, you can't put heat sinks on these if they're in sockets. And these are all socketed, obviously. So I put this copper sort of heat transfer thing, took it off something else and it's stuck on here. And when I put the keyboard on this metal plate, it's touched by this and it actually seems to help transfer the heat off. All right, so the PLA is in, this is the one that was in the C16 and I hope it doesn't destroy my plus four, because at least this thing works. Let's turn this on. Oh, oh wow, okay, it's working. That's a really, it uh, makes me super happy. So there's gotta be another fault on the machine. I suppose the RAM could be bad, or maybe the ROMs are bad. So I can convert, I can switch the ROMs from this over to that one, and we can check that out as well. Okay, so I put my CPU that's working in the other one, the one we just built, back in the C16. I put the PLA, which I know is good. I put a check mark on it, so I know that's good. And I put the TED in here. This is the one with the check mark. I know those chips are all good. I had a thought though, so let me just turn this on and give it a try. Make sure power supply is running. Yes, it is. This is connected reverse. Okay, we're getting nothing. But I wonder if the problem is the CPU socket here not making good contact. So I'm gonna push down on it. No, okay. Just because, you know, I'm plugging that, those pin headers into the CPU socket and it's quite possible that it's just not making great contact. Looks like it's going in there just fine. Well, anyhow, I mean, I guess the relief is I know that the PLA is good and so is the, my adapted processor. I know this TED is good. These ROMs I haven't verified, but in all likelihood, those are fine as well, especially because I put the other ones in and it's working. All right, thanks for watching so far. I'm going to do more troubleshooting in part two. So if you like what you've seen, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. Uh, definitely subscribe for more videos. Thank you for watching. Bye.